In, over the last four years, between 2014 and 2018, we have been reflecting on the events of 100 years ago. For instance, we're making this film today on the 21st of March 2018. And exactly 100 years ago today was the beginning of the great German Spring Offensive. Every aspect of that world-shattering and indeed world-creating conflict has been studied in great detail and commemorated. But we often forget some of the individuals and their unique contribution. And one of the unique contributions to that time, which to my mind is still very valuable today, is the work of a man known as Woodbine Willie, an Anglican padre on the Western Front, Geoffrey Ancatel Studdard Kennedy. With me today is one of the great experts on Studdard Kennedy, Dr. Stuart Bell. Stuart, welcome back to the University of Nottingham. Thank you. Studdard Kennedy, the man, everyone knows the headline of the Woodbines. Let's make that a little bit more a little bit flesh that out and show that it's there's, there's more to the man than that certainly um, the reason for that nickname of course is that he gave out woodbines with the new testaments as soldiers um, left the massive army base at rouen um, heading east towards the western front um, it shocks us now um, but smoking was almost universal going back a hundred years and therefore any shock we have is really quite anachronistic. And of course uh, neither of us are old men and yet when we were children we you could still buy woodbines <laughs> and we saw woodbines. I, I, my father smoked woodbines. They were simply the most common. Yeah and they were considered a good cigarette. Okay. Now I know that because my father <laughs> thought they were very good yes. Uh, the interesting thing is that he actually gives a very interesting definition of ministry. He says, what do you need to be a good padre? And I would extend that to what do you need to be a good Christian minister? And he says, a heart full of love and a haversack full of cigarettes. So it's interesting that he has an incredibly incarnational approach to ministry. Yes, the minister has to actually love. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not enough to be an administrator, to be a religious functionary. But equally, you actually have to engage with human beings with their realities and their needs. It's one thing, you can talk about the joy of God to your blue in the face. If someone, if, if joy is experienced in a cigarette. And of course, um, part of one of his poems is, is, is taken out into a hymn that many Christian traditions sing, Awake, Awake to Love and Work. Uh, and that expresses that importance of love um, for him, love of, of God's creation, love of the people he was trying to serve. Okay, let's try and get behind the man. Uh, everyone knows that he emerged on the Western Front. A few people know his post-war work when he worked for the Industrial Christian Fellowship. And in fact, he killed himself with work because he, 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 he dies of a chest complaint due to overwork in, in, in the late 1920s. Tell me about, about the, about, about more about the man and his background. His father uh, was an Anglican vicar um, in Leeds, in a very poor part of Leeds. And I guess in a sense, Stella Kennedy learned his trade or what the nature of the job was there. Um, very strong Irish connections. Um, he got a first um, in a degree in Dublin. He then taught in a school in Horlick for a couple of years and then became a curate in rugby. Uh, and even then his oratorical skills were recognised. Um, as war broke out, he was serving in Worcester, um, in the parish of St. Paul's, a very, very poor parish. You would call it a slum parish. Uh, and there he gave and gave and gave. Um, one famous story tells of his wife arriving home to finding he was the carting bed. the bed out because he felt the family down the road needed the bed more than he and his wife did. The curious thing is he belongs to that strand of Anglicanism that combined incredibly high church liturgy a uh, very serious-minded theology with, 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 with social engagement. But that, of course, was very 
common at the time, the distinction being that so many of those Anglo-Catholic clergy um, committed themselves um, to celibacy so that they, without the family responsibilities, could go into those really tough parishes. Um, so that Kennedy rather takes his family in with him. And before we go back, I, I want to pick you up on something. You, see, you mentioned that he, 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 even though he was, he was actually born in England, he always self-identified as, as, as an Irish. Yes. And he then goes to, goes and do, does his degree in Trinity College Dublin. And interestingly, one of the things that, uh, I don't know whether you've noticed it or not, but his prose has Irishisms in it. Sometimes his prose, his, his, his dialect poems are in an Irish style. Sometimes they're in a Cockney style. Yes. It's very strange in, in and some sometimes ways. He uses the, sometimes he uses actual verbal constructions that where I grew up would be, would be you know, the teachers would say, oh, no, no, that's, uh, that's, that's wrong, which are actually substrate interferences from Irish. But uh, there's another aspect, though. We all, every, we, we have both spent a year editing his most famous work, The Hardest Part, or at least his most notorious work, The Hardest Part. And one of the aspects of him that, that comes up is that we know he worked in, in poor parishes. We know he was, he, he was working in a parish in, in Worcester, but he, he actually had a private life of study. He had an enormously well-stocked mind. He had been studying for the best part of 10 years before the war. So when he actually finds himself in the trenches, he can, he can, he can produce a theological argument with no footnotes, but with quotes that shows he actually, he's not just reading this material second hand, he is actually studying very, he is up to date, he is thinking through big issues using the best sources of the day. And nor is he pulling a book down off his shelves yeah. because he hadn't got any shelves um, out on the Western Front. It was all in his head. Uh, the, 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 one of the interesting things is that he has he he is very suspicious of desk-based theology he wants to have theology wherever christians are so it's almost you he's using an existentialist model of theology he doesn't begin by saying here is an abstract problem which we, you might want to think about and now i will go through it and you listen to me thinking he begins by saying it was 3 a.m. He can hear the guns behind him. He can see a German sausage balloon in front of him. And suddenly one of the great mines goes off on Messines Ridge. And right there and then he expects you to enter into a reflection with him, which takes you from a precise moment out into the middle of a theological argument and then brings you back afterwards at the very end, back to that pastoral context. And, and, and actually has to invent a little graphic device, the equivalent of a, of a, a shimmer in a, in a film where you leave one time to go into another time. And the shimmer, is, he actually puts a code in. I'm now leaving the battlefield to go into a Christian reflection. I'm returning to the battlefield and going into another Christian reflection. And then he concludes, always ending up in a precise location in our world. Uh, one of the things that your research has shown is that not only uh, can you work out the dates, but we can actually work out almost within a couple of hundred meters where he was on the Western Front. Absolutely. I, mean, I think people who haven't studied the First World War don't appreciate that the distances were so small that so many lives were lost gaining 100 metres, 200 metres, um, that so much took place in sight of other places. So we can be, as you say, one bunker, one small hill. Um, we know exactly where he was when he was making those reflections. One other aspect of Studdard Kennedy's life that I think we have to, to look at is 
that while he creates a fascinating theology to try and deal with how human beings can be so brutal to one another, he also creates a, a, a new theology of the idea of Christian social action. And that's the bit that takes place after Woodbine Willie. Could we just dwell for a moment on, on, on that period when he's working with the Industrial Christian Fellowship? The Industrial Christian Fellowship, the aim was to try and heal the growing rift in the 20s um, between what they call capital and labour, uh, between the owners um, and, uh, and the workers, but in a decidedly apolitical manner. Um, in a sense, it was perhaps politically naive, but that was his aim. And so he was the missioner and he would give speech after speech after speech to huge crowds um, trying to advocate this new post-war solution that will put an end. Because we must remember that before the war started in 1914, there had been a massive increase in industrial unrest and it was only the war that, that temporarily halted that and it would have continued and it did continue afterwards, of course. And of course, we think of things like the like the great general strike, probably the closest Britain came ever to civil war. But Studdard Kennedy, it's not that he stands aside from it, but he presents a Christian alternative to it. And in the process, gives the impression of being very uh, opposed to many of the factory owners. Um, he uses all sorts of metaphors uh, to suggest that really they need to treat their um, uh, workers far better than they have been doing. And so he, although he tried to be apolitical, he was associated with um, supporting the ordinary working man, many of whom had come back from the Western Front, of course, uh, which led to him being refused a funeral in Westminster Abbey because the dean thought he was a socialist. Yes. And, yeah, that's, that's the most amazing, probably one of the greatest theologians and one of the greatest servants that the Anglican Church had in the first 30 years of this century is, is denied a funeral rite, but he has been given a feast day in the new Anglican calendar. The, I think we would both agree that of his many works, the hardest part is the gem. And, well, it was your work that led me to do other work and together we've produced a new edition and I think we can fairly say it makes Studdard Kennedy accessible in a way that he probably never was before. And potentially more widely read because it's not clear who read him the first time because he wasn't taken seriously as a theologian a hundred years ago to everyone's loss I think. Yeah so the hard uh, our celebration of 2018 has been to take Studdard Kennedy's The Hardest Part, add the footnotes he couldn't add, but I'm sure would have loved to have added because he was writing on the Western Front, and to present him again as a voice that is crisp, clear, and original. Thanks for coming in, Stuart. <laughs>